the 4th of November 2024. By the following Tuesday afternoon I knew it wasn't my imagination. It started with Mrs. LeBaron, November 18, 2060. My homeroom teacher. She kept glancing in my direction during the 20 minutes before classes started. And it wasn't a nice look. It said, I know what you did. And I think you're terrible. I tried to shrug it off. Tevin's murder was all over the news and it was all anybody could talk about at school. But I didn't think anyone knew that I'd been called in by the FBI. Well, except for Yams. And he'd never tell anyone. But then my chemistry teacher, Mr. Pierce, the 12th of March 2049, called me over as class was letting out and he said, Hang in there show. In this country you're innocent until proven guilty, and I understood then that all the teachers knew. Worse yet, Mr. Pierce seemed to be the only teacher who was on my side. In French class Mrs. Johansson, the 2nd of February 2041, snapped at me for using the wrong preposition while Mike Doherty, the 6th of May 2067, had done the very same thing right before and she hadn't even blinked. Yams leaned forward from behind me and whispered, Why are they all acting so weird around you? I didn't answer him, because out in the hallway I heard Harris call to a student caught out of class after the bell. It suddenly dawned on me that maybe nobody knew I'd been called into the FBI offices over the weekend but they could know about the meeting in Principal Harris' office. The faculty's reaction was too intense for them to have just learned that I'd met with the agents. They seemed to know the details of the conversation in Harris' office, which meant it could only have come from Harris himself. I didn't know if he was allowed to tell the other teachers about what was said, but it was pretty obvious that he had, and it really upset me. I started to wonder who else he'd told. The news reporters covering the story were saying what a monster Tevin's murderer was. And after seeing the photo of his dead body, I knew that firsthand. It was bad enough to think that agents Ushijima and Sugawara thought me capable of doing something like that to a young kid. But it was a whole different kind of nightmare to think that all my teachers believed I was capable of that too. As if to have my worst fears confirmed. A little later as I was leaving pre-calc. Mr. Chavez said, Did you really kill that kid Shoyo? He'd spoken so low I almost hadn't heard him. But when I glanced up he was looking at me the way Ushijima had. Like he simply knew I was guilty. Immediately, I dropped my gaze and bolted out of there. Yams had to run to catch up. Hey, he called, following me to a barely used stairwell. Sho, what's going on? It's nothing, I was trying to hide my face from him. I didn't want to make a bigger deal out of it than it already was. And I was terrified everyone else at school was going to find out. Yams frowned and caught my arm to stop me from walking away. Will you talk to me? Please, seriously? What's up? I took a deep breath. I'm pretty sure Mr. Harris told the other teachers about the meeting with the feds in his office. Whoa, can he do that? I shrugged. I don't know, but it doesn't matter now because obviously the word's out. And pretty soon, the whole school will know and everybody's gonna think I'm a murderer. Yams eyed me with a bit of humor. He always knew when I was being melodramatic. But this time I wasn't playing. I was actually crazy scared. Hey, don't think like that okay? None of the kids know yet. Right? And maybe the teachers will keep it on the down low until the feds actually catch the guy who did this. A sudden and terrible thought occurred to me. But what if they don't Yams? What if they never catch the killer and this hangs over me forever? Yams turned me forward to walk with him and nudged me with his shoulder. You can't let yourself go there. You have to believe that the feds just need a little time to do their thing and figure it out. And then everybody's gonna look totally stupid for thinking it could have been you. The warning bell rang, and Yams quickened his steps, hooking his arm through mine. Come on, try not to think about it okay? I let him pull me along to our next class. But for the rest of the day I avoided looking at anything besides the textbook in front of me. After school I hurried to meet Yams out by the bike rack. I found him standing next to my bike with a wad of paper towels again. There were even more eggs this time. I hate those too, I spat as he and I worked to get the gunk off. From nearby we could see Eric and Mario laughing and poking each other. To add insult to injury. At that moment Kathy and a group of her friends walked by. Ew, they said collectively as we sopped up the mess. I felt my cheeks sear with heat. 
Ignore him. I knew he was right. But I couldn't help looking up to glare at them as they passed. And it was then that I noticed Principal Harris standing near the door watching Yams and me. He then looked over at Mario and Eric, who were still laughing it up. And then Harris simply turned and headed back inside. I felt something bitter twist inside of me. There. Good as new, he'd gotten the last of the egg off and was grinning brightly at me. Thanks. I really wanted to get the hell out of there. Hey, I straddled the bike and we set off for home. You ready for the game on Friday? I sighed. It had been such a bad day that it was hard to focus on something good. What time are we meeting up? I asked, still a bit distracted. I figure if we get there before 7 we can grab a good seat. Unless you want to go to the cheer off at 3? I cocked my head at him. The what? Yams grinned. The Jupiter cheerleaders challenged our squad to a cheer off. That's at 3. I couldn't help but laugh. Yams was so adorably devoted to our cheerleading squad, one of the best in the state. That it cracked me up. I think his unique fascination started when Yams was younger and he used to sit with his dad on Sunday afternoons and watch football. His dad, who was from Texas, always rooted for the Cowboys. And when the Dallas team wasn't performing well, which was often, his dad would focus on the league's best cheerleaders. Yams, who was super klutzy, never really got into football. But he had become enamored with all those pretty girls shaking their moneymakers and doing their flips twists and turns. Cheer combined two things Yams idolized, pretty people and great coordination. He loved it. I hear Jupiter's got a great squad this year, I said just to taunt him. Yeah, I heard that too. Which is why I want to go. You in? I sighed. Ma had been having a really tough time lately with all the stress from the investigation and the worry over money now that I couldn't do readings. Nah, I should hang out with Ma after school. Why don't you go to the cheer off and then come pick me up around 6.30? When he didn't answer, I looked back and saw that he'd fallen behind and was glancing over his shoulder. Yams? I got his attention, and he pushed hard on his skateboard to catch up to me again. I don't want to freak you out or anything, but there's a car following us. I glanced back so fast that I felt the bike wobble underneath me. Sure enough, a black sedan was cruising slowly down the street. It was too far away to see who was driving, but I had a pretty good idea. Let's cut through the park. We hurried our pace to the park, where the car couldn't follow us. I felt pretty good about ditching my least favorite FBI agents until I parted ways with Yams and came around the corner to my street. Only to find that same black sedan sitting at the curb a little bit down from my house. I was tempted to flip them off, but stopped myself because I didn't know if there was some weird law against giving a fed the finger. Along with not doing any more readings, Daichi had also warned me to keep my nose clean. So over the next couple of days I ignored every teacher who gave me a suspicious look. I also ignored the black sedan that would show up unexpectedly in front of our house or two houses down the street and sit there for hours. On the night of the game, Ma made dinner, which was huge for her. She surprised me with spaghetti alla carbonara, which had been Dad's favorite. I know this has been hard on you, she said as we sat down together. But I want you to know that I'm very proud of you. I blinked. Ma's unexpected display of tenderness had caught me off guard. Thanks. She nodded and played with her utensils. She seemed suddenly nervous about something. You know, though, if you wanted to go back to doing a few readings here or there. I wouldn't mind. My breath caught. I felt anger rise like heat from my chest to my cheeks. I knew it was Ma's addiction talking. But why did she have to ruin such a sweet moment by being so transparent? Daichi said I couldn't, I reminded her. Unable to keep the bitterness out of my tone. Ma was still playing with her utensils. I know, but what Daichi doesn't know, I stared at the plate of pasta. And my appetite vanished. Ma must have noticed that I was upset because she quickly added. It's just that the settlement check doesn't quite cover our needs. Show, you know we're always short at the end of the month. I held back the retort that was on the tip of my tongue. I was the one who always made sure the checks got written and sent out the payments. Because otherwise Ma would forget and we'd have the lights turned off. I knew as well as she did what came in and what went out. And the thing that always brought us up short was the liquor tab. I cleared my throat and stared at my plate. 
I don't think it's a good idea, she nodded reluctantly. Okay, then maybe I'll look for something, she said. But I could tell she was mad. Ma's employment history was spotty at best. And because she'd lost her license, whatever she applied for had to be within walking distance or a short bus ride. Which I knew greatly limited what she'd be able to get. We ate the rest of the meal in relative silence. And I couldn't wait to bolt out the back door and head to the game. I'd told Yams to meet me on the block behind my house so we'd avoid the black sedan that might be out. Front. After cutting through the yard of the people behind us, I came out onto Mount Clare Street, where I saw Yams in his mom's minivan a little ways down the block. Hey, I didn't know which house backed up to yours. You did fine. We made our way through my neighborhood, careful to keep well away from my street. The route took us a bit out of our way, but worth it if we could avoid the feds. On the way, Yams became excited and said, Oh my god, show, wait until you see the new girl on Jupiter's squad, I laughed, I take it she's cute, she's beautiful, I laughed again, Yams seemed to have a new crush on a different cheerleader every year. After arriving at school, Yams parked near a streetlight and we hoofed it over to the gate where we had to show our school IDs to get in. We didn't even bother with the poplar high bleachers but aimed our steps toward the visiting team's side. On our way we passed the concession stand, where there was already a line. I saw kids I'd grown up with, Christy Junger, January 14, 2100. Brady McDonald, March 17, 2034. Molly Thompson, 9 October 2082. And Tim Goodacre, September 21, 2071. I'd ridden the bus to elementary school with Christy and Brady. I'd been in the same catechism class with Tim, and I'd gone to aftercare with Molly. And yet, when Yams and I walked by, there was barely a flicker of recognition. I was used to being ignored by my classmates, but with the whole Tevin Tybalt thing hanging over my head I felt a little more vulnerable and sensitive to it. Which made me even more grateful for my friendship with Yams. The bleachers on the visiting team side were fairly full. Jupiter High is our closest rival and their school always comes out to support the team but, Yams found us great seats three rows up at the right corner. I sat down and immediately began to scan the visiting team's bench, which was a mass of light blue and bright white except for three navy rugby shirts. I found who I was looking for right away. He's here, Yams whispered, grinning and nudging his chin toward one of the rugby shirts. I smiled back and relished the rapid uptick of my heart while I took in the blonde curls and broad shoulders I'd recognize anywhere. Kay was as beautiful as I remembered. Maybe more so because since the previous spring, when I'd last seen him, he'd grown taller and his shoulders were now even broader. From freshman year on he'd been the football team's manager, keeping stats for the coaches and rooting hard for Jupiter. I usually only got to see him two or three times a year, when our two football teams played against each other and then during the spring when he played soccer for Jupiter. Our soccer teams always played against each other twice once during the regular season and once during the playoffs so I'd see him at those matchups. But it was harder to get near him then because he was always on the field. As I stared at the back of Kay's head, that knot that I'd been carrying in my chest since Tevin had been abducted began to loosen. I wanted nothing more than to feel the texture of Kay's soft curls. And then, as if sensing that someone was watching him, I saw that head begin to turn. I shifted my gaze away quickly, pretending to focus on the game, but then I snuck another glance and was shocked to see Kay staring back at me. For a moment I couldn't breathe or look away. And then he smiled, and my heart stopped. I think it skipped at least three beats before it started pounding again. Yams nudged me with his elbow. He's looking at you, he whispered. I felt the corners of my mouth quirk. And my brain felt fuzzy. Could this really be happening? Could this boy who I'd secretly adored for the past two years actually? Really be smiling at me? And then I realized he was. And then, even more miraculously, I was able to smile back at him. In that instant everything else went silent. And it felt like the whole world had paused to allow us a moment of perfection. It was the best I'd ever felt in my whole life. Hi, he mouthed. My breath came quick and I went lightheaded while my hands began to tingle. His smile widened, and somehow I managed to nod and smile back at him, silently thanking God for this small bit of perfect happiness.
In the next second the spell was broken when the crowd erupted in a roar. I jumped as all around me people leapt to their feet and began to cheer and clap. I lost sight of Kay. And by the time the crowd settled down again, I saw that he was back to scribbling on his clipboard and focusing on the game. But I'd had that moment that one. Sweet. Amazing. Perfect moment. I shut my eyes to replay it again in my mind. Show. Yams whispered excitedly. Reluctantly. I opened my eyes. Yams was pointing to the cheerleading squad now moving down the sidelines. See her? He said. Nudging me while pointing to an exotically pretty girl with silky black hair. A perky nose. And full lips. Pretty much every high school boy's wet dream. She was also way out of Yams's league. But as his best friend. I wasn't about to tell him that. Her name's Peyton, Yams said. And I swear he added a sigh. Peyton Wiley. She's a junior. And she moved here from Colorado three months ago. I couldn't help but laugh. He was so smitten. How do you know her name and her history already? Yams blushed. At the cheer challenge today I pretended I was on Poplar's school newspaper and asked the Jupiter assistant coach about her. I'm impressed, I said. Leave it to Yams to think up something clever to find out about the new girl on the team. God. She's so pretty, he sighed. Next to us one of the Jupiter kids looked at Yams like he was weird. And Yams blushed. Clearing his throat. He added. I mean. Go Jupiter. I laughed into my hand. And Yams squared his shoulders. Trying to regain his composure. But I saw him continue to sneak glances Peyton's way. Still giggling. I was about to tease him a little when a couple of parents wedged their way to the bleacher just below us and sat down. The man took his seat right in front of me. Obscuring the perfect view I'd had of Jupiter's team bench. Great, I muttered. Leaning to the right and left. Trying to see around him. But he was too big. I started to look for another place to sit. And motioned to Yams that we had to move. He frowned because he still had a good view of Peyton. But then he pointed to a small area in the very front that was dead center to the cheerleaders and even closer to Kay. I nodded. And we got up and snaked our way over. While we were moving, I hoped that Kay wouldn't look up and see me making my way closer to him. I didn't want to be that girl. Still, I felt brave with yams next to me. At last we were settled again and we both smiled at each other. Mission accomplished. I felt a warmth bubble up in my middle. And I couldn't seem to stop smiling. We gotta be cool. He was clearly fighting a grin of his own. Nearby, the cheerleaders were all chatting and gossiping happily to one another. And much of the attention was centered on Peyton. There was a timeout from the Poplar Hollow side. And the teams gathered around their coaches. Allowing us to hear some of what the cheer squad was saying. You're so lucky, said one girl to Peyton. I can't believe you're getting a freaking car for your birthday. It's only because the rents are feeling guilty about moving me out here right before my junior year, Peyton replied. Like getting a car for her birthday wasn't a huge deal. I mean, I love it here and all. But they don't have to know that. Right? All the girls laughed. When are you getting it? Another girl asked. Next Wednesday. On my birthday, Peyton said. So pleased with herself and the attention that I couldn't understand how it didn't turn Yams off. I get the keys right after school. And about two seconds after that I'll be picking you bitches up to do some major damage to my dad's credit card. The girls all shrieked and giggled. And I couldn't help but feel that if my dad were alive. No way would I say something that's stupid and shallow. But when Yams turned to grin at me, I shoved a smile onto my lips and nodded like I was happy and excited for Peyton too. A whistle blew then, and the teams broke their huddle and started to head back toward the center of the field. I snuck a peek at Kay and saw that he was looking and grinning at me again. I felt my cheeks heat, and shyly glanced away, secretly thrilled, pretending to take an interest in the crowd. I froze when my gaze landed on someone familiar. All those warm, 
Gushy feelings I'd had a moment before vanished. And my blood ran cold. Staring hard at me was none other than Agent Ashijima. Who was sitting midway up in the stands, right next to him was Agent Sugawara. Who was busy looking at the field. Immediately, I snapped my head to face forward again and slapped a hand on Yamza's arm. What? But I was too unnerved to speak. I couldn't believe the two agents had managed to follow us to the game and even stalked us to the visiting team's bleachers. I didn't know what to do. Hey, look, they're starting, Yam said, his attention already back on Peyton. Sure enough, Jupiter's squad was spreading out in the small section between the stands and the field. And they began to clap their hands and stomp their feet. Meanwhile, my mind was racing, and I felt like I had to get out of there. But wouldn't the Fed simply follow me? Wouldn't rushing out of the stands call attention to me? And what if Kay was watching? Would he see the panicked look on my face? I couldn't risk glancing over at him. Next to me I heard Yamza's breath catch. And I realized that Peyton was still sidestepping to the right. Coming nearer and nearer to where we sat. She stopped in front of us. And then the most horrible thing happened. She was maybe four and a half feet away from me near enough to see the color of her eyes and read the date on her forehead. For a moment I was so stunned I couldn't even breathe. And then our eyes met and the expression on her face became confused. But I couldn't look away from her. That date on her forehead lifted off her olive skin and hovered in the air as if to taunt me. Oh God! I gasped. And jumped to my feet. Bolting to the stairs leading down to the side of the field. I didn't stop until I was out in the parking lot. But from there I didn't quite know where to go. I felt panicked and shaken. And like my whole world was being pulled apart by a black hole of little numbers. Yams caught up with me. Wheezing and coughing as he pulled out his inhaler. What's wrong? Yams has bad asthma. And I knew that his attacks were sometimes brought on by stress. But this was too big and I was too freaked out to keep it to myself. It's Peyton. I paced anxiously back and forth in front of him. What about her? His breathing settling down a little. I stopped and looked anxiously toward the stands. Show? Come on. Tell me. My gaze shifted back to Yams. I saw her death date. He squinted at me. Aunt? It's next week. Yams's mouth fell open. No. I could only stand there and hold his gaze. I wasn't wrong. 11-12. 2024. You got it wrong, Yams replied. But then he seemed to reconsider the date. Wait. Show. That's, that's next Wednesday. Her birthday. Maybe you saw her birthday and not her death day. I pressed my lips together. I never see birthdays. I only see death. Yams turned and eyed the visiting team's side of the field. We have to warn her, he said. And I could tell he was about to run back and do just that. I caught his arm and squeezed it hard. You can't, Yams tried to shake me off. But I wasn't letting go. Show, we have to, still. I was determined. Yams, please listen to me for a minute. Will you? Finally he stopped fighting and stared at me expectantly. I pointed toward the bleachers with my free hand. Sugawara and Ushijima followed us here. They're up in the stands right now. Yams paled even more. How did they find you? I began to pace again. I don't know. Maybe they saw me leave the house out the back door. Or maybe they had a hunch. But they're here. If we go back and tell Peyton that she's going to die next week. Don't you think that'll look really, really bad to them? Then you stay here and I'll go, Yams said. Turning away from me, I clamped down on his arm once more and wouldn't let go. Getting right up into his face I said. Yams. Stop. You have to think. I mean. Sugawara and Ushijima know you. They've even talked to you. They also know that we're best friends and we hang out together. If you go back there and say something to Peyton and she ends up dying next Wednesday. They'll know it came from me. Remember what Daichi said? He said under no circumstances can I tell anybody their date. 
Yam stood back and simply stared at me as if he couldn't believe what was coming out of my mouth. We're really gonna let her die? Show, come on, she's getting that new car next week. What if she goes cruising with her friends? And she gets distracted and loses control of the car. And then some of them die too? I hadn't been close enough to the other girls to see their death dates. There could be more than one casualty next Wednesday. I balled my hands into fists. So frustrated because I didn't know what to do. We have to warn her, Yams repeated more gently this time as he laid a hand on my shoulder. I mean, we didn't try hard enough with Tevin. And look what happened to him. I winced as if he'd struck me. Ouch. Yams immediately lifted both hands in surrender. Sorry sorry sorry. I sighed. No, you're right. We can't sit back and do nothing. We'll warn her, but not here and not now. Yams frowned. He didn't like my answer. Then when and how? We have a couple of days. I'm pretty sure we can figure out how to get an anonymous message to her. She'll think it's a joke, he countered. Looking again at the field. And what do you think she'll decide if you go marching up to her right now and say? Gee, not to upset you or anything. But you're going to die on your birthday. Just thought you should know. Behind us the roar of the crowd erupted again. But this time it was from the poplar hollow side. Yam stood there looking at the field for a long time. And I could tell he was wavering about what to do. I promise you we'll figure out a way to warn her yams. On my life I promise you. But please, not here and not now okay? Let's think of another place and time when there aren't so many people around and in a way that doesn't lead back to us. Yam stared hard at me and sighed. Then he looked down and kicked at the ground. She can't die show. We have to save her. I didn't immediately reply because I had no idea what to say. If mere words could prevent someone from dying, then my dad would still be alive and so would Tevin Tybalt. Still, after a long stretch of silence, what I said was, I know, buddy, I know, but you have to trust me on this. We can't say anything to her tonight. Whatever, he grumbled, turning away from me, let's get out of here. I tried not to feel the sting of that cold shoulder. But it was hard. It got harder still when Yams dropped me off in front of my house and without another word sped away. I knew he wasn't angry with me per se. But it felt like he was. And I wished very much that I'd waited to tell him until after the game. I didn't know how we were going to warn Peyton without it coming back to me. I vowed to call Yams in the morning and talk about it. But when I walked inside I found Ma on the floor. Passed out cold. I cried out as I dropped to her side. Momentarily panicked by finding her on the floor face down. Grabbing her wrist. I felt for a pulse. And glimpsed an empty liter of vodka lying under the coffee table. I closed my eyes in relief as I felt her pulse. Which was slow but steady. When I strained. I could hear her breathing rhythmically. Two. With a tired sigh I got to work cleaning up. And then moved Ma to the couch. It took me a while because she was completely limp. But at last I got her situated and covered with the afghan. And then I stood in the doorway of the kitchen looking at her lying there on our beat up old leather couch in a room that smelled like cigarettes. With dingy blue walls. And taupe carpeting littered with stains. I shut my eyes to block out the sight and thought about Kay and how he'd smiled at me and mouthed the word hi. In an instant what had filled me with such sunny happiness clouded over with a threatening storm. I opened my eyes and looked again at Ma and our house. And I knew that no boy would ever want to get close to a guy like me. A guy who lived in a house with threadbare carpeting and dingy walls that smelled like an ashtray. A guy who saw death in every face. Who was labeled a witch at school. Who had a drunk for a mother. And a father who died in a gunfight with drug dealers. A guy who was being investigated for murder by the FBI. I was like a whirlpool of tragedy. And anybody who dared to get too close to me could get sucked in and drown. Like I was drowning right now. And I knew that it would never be better.
Our house would continue to slowly fall down around us. I would always see death. People at school would always think I was a witch. Ma would always be drunk. Tevin Tybalt would always be dead. And so would my dad. For years K had been like the sun to me, shining brightly from the Jupiter sidelines. Tonight, for a brief moment, his star had nearly banished all of the misery right out of my world. But I finally realized that I should probably let go of living in the fantasy that a boy as beautiful as him could meet a guy like me and feel anything other than pity. I needed to accept that this was my reality. And nothing was ever going to change it. With a heavy heart, I climbed the stairs to bed.